good morning. It is a beautiful day, a beautiful Lord's Day. What an opportunity we have to be coming together and to uh, open God's Word. We're going to be starting a new series, and we're going to be calling it Blind Spots. And today we want to be looking at being blinded by anger, but we're going to be uh, talking about checking our emotions. Uh, when you usually think of the phrase blind spots, it's equated with driving, isn't it? You know, you, you have to double check your mirrors to make sure that you, you know, that something's not there that, or that you might think is there. Blind spots can be difficult because, uh, you know, uh, you can't see what you can't see. And you have to intentionally look at something that you can't see unless you're intentionally looking at it. I mean, if, if you've ever taught anyone how to, to drive, you know that, that, that you're constantly saying to somebody, check, check your blind spot, check over your shoulder, you know, as you're merging into traffic or if you're changing lanes. And, you know, there's a sense of urgency about it. It's intentional checking to make sure you know, that something is not there. Uh, and what we want to do in this series is that we want to be talking about some blind spots that are common with, with most of us. <clears throat> Things that uh, we don't see unless we're intentionally looking for them. Specifically, we're going to be talking about some <clears throat> emotional <clears throat> blind spots. You know, since the pandemic, many people have experienced these these sudden realizations of emotions that have just snuck up on them. You know, they, they have this fear, or they have this anger, or they have this discouragement, or they have this joy, or they have this anxiety, and suddenly they're thinking, where did this come from? And it came all of a sudden. And so what we want to do here as we check our emotional blind spots in our, the, the blind spots in our lives is, is we want to study some Old Testament characters and from them, uh, some are going to be familiar more so than others. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 that one of the reasons that we have the Old Testament is to teach us. And so that's what we want to do. You know, automobiles here recently, especially since I started driving, when I started driving, you know, you had your single side view mirror by the driver's door. Does that pretty well relate to everybody? And it was a luxury car that had two mirrors. You know, well, now we have the two mirrors, side view mirrors, and they have things that when something gets in the blind spot, they'll have an arrow that starts fla flashing, a light that starts flashing, which doesn't do you any good if you're not looking that direction. <laughs> but that, that's there. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's to help us, wake us up to, to what's going on there. I don't know exactly how it all works. There's sensors in the mirror. It alerts us, and it's flashing. It's letting us know that you need to be checking your blind spot. And that's what I want us, if we will allow these Old Testament characters to do for us, is to be kind of like flashing lights warning us of some things that we need to pay attention to in our lives. So today I want to talk about the blind spot of, of anger. The word anger first appears in the scriptures in Genesis chapter 4. And it's in the account of, uh, of Adam and Eve's two sons, these brothers Cain and Abel. Now, verse 2 says that now Abel kept the flock. So Abel was a shepherd, and Cain worked the soil. He's a farmer. And so in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the spoil or soil as an offering to the Lord. Now, at this point, we don't know that God had required that of them. It doesn't seem to be a suggestion there. Cain and Abel just seem to bring these offerings to the Lord out of recognition that he is the one who has blessed them. And so Cain brings his offering to the Lord. And verse 4 tells us that, but Abel, the younger brother, brought fat portions from some of the firstborns of the flock. The Lord looked at favor on favor of Abel and his offering, and on Cain, his offering, he did not look with favor, the NIV says. Or the New King James says, did not look at it with respect. Notice that God first looks at a person and then he looks at the offering. He, he sees our heart first and he sees that Abel is, 
is giving from the first fruits and he's giving from the fat and he's, he's given the very best that he has because he's given it to God. And so the insinuation is that he's giving the best, but Cain is giving the leftovers. As if Abel is saying, God, I recognize that, that everything is from you and I want to give you my very best. And I want to give you my first as an acknowledgement that I am dependent upon you, Lord, as uh, a way, this is a way of me saying and showing my gratitude for what you have provided. And Cain gives to God, but it seems that he is giving more of the leftovers. Okay, God, here, here's a little bit of what's left at the end of the month. Or, here, I've gone through the harvest, and I've completed my harvest, and this is what we didn't harvest, and we're going to give that to you. The insinuation is, is that Abel gives to God his best and his first, but Cain doesn't. And so Abel's offering is accepted. Abel's offering is blessed, but Cain's is rejected or not respected. And verse 5 gives us Cain's response. And here's the word. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast, the NIV says. He was very angry. And this, again, like I mentioned, is the first time this word is used. Researchers have identified that there are 34,000 different kinds of emotions that we can have. 34,000. Now, some people find that hard to believe. Others, they live with somebody who would say, hey, yeah, that's probably about the right amount. <laughs> Some might say, yeah, I think that's a little low. But researchers tell us that there are 34,000. They also say that there are primarily only three emotions. The primary emotions that we tend to identify are happy, sad, and angry. And so if you are going to translate this into emojis, then you would have something that would look like this it's on the screen. Happy, sad, and angry. Like 34,000 emotions, but these are the three that we tend to see. These are the three that we tend to say. I feel happy. I feel sad. Or I feel angry. Genesis 4 is... is the first time, and it's not the last time, that word is used. More than any other emotion, probably, except than fear, is, is this word anger that we enjoy and have. And it's incredibly contagious. You know, in other words, you put one person, an angry person, in a room, and you know what? The room will become angry. You put a person who is... Uh, succumbs to fear, a very fearful person in a room, and the room will all of a sudden become more scared. All emotions have this dynamic about them. In fact, studies have been showing that. Dr. Daniel Goldman explains that all emotions are contagious. Goldman says, he says, emotions are more contagious than the flu. This dynamic is so powerful that in one study, three volunteers sat silently in a circle for two minutes, and at the end of the time, the most emotionally expressive person transmitted his or her mood to the other two without ever saying a word. In, in, in every such session, the mood of the most expressive person had going into it was the mood that the other two would feel coming out of it, whether it be happy, whether it be bored, whether it be anxious or angry. So all emotions can be contagious, but anger and fear tend to be the emotions that are most contagious. And if you've ever been, had somebody who is emotionally expressive and, and maybe feels happiness, and, and, and then there's somebody that's emotionally expressive and they feel anger or irritability or annoyance or frustration, the emotion will come become more contagious as they go on. The one who is the, the most contagious feels uh, in feelings that they may have. So many people would agree because they live or work with somebody who is the kind of person that sets the thermostat. 
that when they come into a room and in, if they're angry, then you know what the temperature of the room is going to be. Cain was very angry. And here is what he says in verse 6. He said, the Lord said to Cain, he said, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, and here's the warning, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And then in verse 8, it says, now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother and killed Abel. Go back to verse 6 here, and God asked Cain a question. And it's a question that I really want us to wrestle with here today. And that is, why are we angry at times? Because I think it's important that God doesn't tell Cain, okay, Cain, this is how you're to feel. He doesn't tell him. Here's how you should feel. He asked him, why is it that you feel this way? Why are you angry? Because he wants Cain to stop and to identify what he feels. And then he asks, why do you feel the way that you do? And many people have never learned how to do that. Maybe they grew up in a church or they grew up in a home where there are basically two feelings. The feelings that you should feel and the feelings that you shouldn't feel. And if you feel the feelings that you shouldn't feel, and, and you know they'll tell you you need to start feeling this way. These are the feelings that you need to have. And, and if you're feeling in the way that you shouldn't feel, then these are the feelings that you should have. And, and so you stop feeling that way, which isn't very helpful, is it? It's also not very biblical. Because you stop and you say, how do I feel? And why do I feel that way? And this is what God does to Cain. Because he is a helping him to identify, you're angry? Why are you angry? Check your blind spot. Stop. Look over your shoulder. Look over to, to see what's going on. Why is it that you feel the way that you do? Now, not all anger in Scripture is sinful. Not all anger in Scripture is evil. But I would say that most of what we experience as anger would fall under that category. And there are exceptions, like in Ephesians 4, where it says, in, in your anger, do not sin. The New King James is a little more forceful. It says, be angry and do not sin. But there is a righteous anger we see in Jesus when he goes into the temple and he overturns the tables there. He's angry because his father's house had been turned from a place of prayer to a place where people were getting cheated out of money. Items were being sold at unfair prices and they were required to give sacrifices. And so they had to buy it. And the temple had been turned into this kind of airport economy where you buy it, but you're going to pay a whole lot more buying it there than you are outside the temple. And so Jesus is angry because people are being taken advantage of. We see Jesus angry with the religious leaders in Matthew 23. Very confrontational with them. He even calls them some names, trying to get their attention. But again, he's doing this because he's being protective of people who are vulnerable. And so when Jesus is angry, he's not angry because he's been offended. He's angry because he's protecting those who are in a vulnerable place. Now, most of our anger is because we've been insulted. Most of our anger is because we've been treated unjustly. And it's, it's not what you see in Jesus. Because when he is mocked, when he is ridiculed, when he is being unjustly accused, the Bible says that he stood to his, in front of his accusers and was silent. I mean... He's not angry. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't have to. He knows who he is. And, and when he's, you know, his hands are there ready to be nailed on the cross, what does Jesus do? He has all the power in the world to stop that. But he says, Father, forgive them. So when Jesus is angry, it's not because he's been offended or that he's been hurt. It's because he's angry on behalf of, of people who are vulnerable. That's righteous anger. That's protective anger. That's purposeful anger. 
but it still needs to be controlled because there's been a lot of powerful movements that have come because somebody was angry about injustice. But most of the anger that we feel falls under the categories not of, of that is of protective or purposeful or, or righteous. So why was Cain angry? I, I think the point here, there's a lot of things that you could come up with. But ultimately, he's angry because he's comparing himself with his brother. He's comparing himself with his brother and the br life that his brother has, and, and it just doesn't seem fair. He, he looks at his brother, and he is jealous of his brother. He compares himself with his brother, and then he's disappointed. He, he wants to be treated the way his brother Abel is being treated and getting treated by God. He, he has these expectations about God and about life, and it's just not happening the way that he thinks it ought to happen. And so he gets bitter, and he gets this disappointed anger, and, and then he gets angry at Abel, and then he takes it out on Abel. But what did Abel do to him? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. The anger is directed at Abel, but the anger is really, he's really, Cain is really angry with himself. And God says, you need to do what's right. If you do, if you, if you just do what is right, you know, things will be all right. But Cain doesn't want to do what's right. Cain doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to change. He doesn't want to give of his best. He, he, he doesn't want to make any changes there, so he directs his anger towards Abel. And I think a lot of people get angry today because they feel shame or they feel guilty or they feel conviction. And it's a whole lot easier to be angry at other people than it is for us to take responsibility for ourselves, isn't it? And you see that with Cain. He's angry, and so he takes it out on Abel. And Abel has done nothing to him. And, and for many people, anger is just a secondary emotion. Go back to the flashing lights on the side view mirror. It's flashing at us. It's telling us to check your blind spot. And, and, and your anger flashes, and it's telling you there's something in your blind spot. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's fear. Fear often comes at us sideways, like anger. There's something much easier for men than it is for women, and some women it happens with, but it's easier for us to just say, I'm angry, rather than to say, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I, know, I, I remember experiencing this back when our girls were very small still and when my mom had passed away, because when my mom was a nurse and when, and when, when the girls were sick, the first phone call, if there was something, was we called my mom. That was the first phone call. Maybe before she'd say, call the doctor then. But, but anyhow, you know, that was our, it was a first. And so when my mom passed away, that phone call wasn't there. That phone call wasn't there. And I remember oftentimes anger would, would flash up and I, it was because I was afraid. I was scared. I was scared because I didn't know what to do. I was scared because I felt like the task was, was bigger than me. And I was afraid because of uncertain future. I didn't, I didn't know how to guide or direct. Or th These were things that I couldn't control. And so instead of saying, I'm afraid and acknowledging fear and saying, I'm, I'm scared, it was so much easier to say I'm angry because to say I'm scared is vulnerable. To say I'm angry is powerful. And sometimes anger flashes. And if you don't check that blind spot and you find, that you're, and you find you're scared, then, then you end up allowing fear to control you. Sometimes it flashes like we saw with Cain, and it's flashing as conviction or, or, or guilt or, or shame. And a change needs to be made. Something needs to be done. Anger is, is frustration that we have with ourselves. And it's going to continue to rise up in us, and we're going to continue to have it until we get ourselves in alignment with those things that are most important to us. And so we're angry with ourselves, and, and it ends up that we take it out on those that are around us. Sometimes it's flashing, and, and, and it's pointing to fatigue. 
There's a lot of that these days. People are just overwhelmed. They're tired. And, and they become angry. They go to bed angry, they wake up annoyed, and then they are always irritated, they're lashing out, and they don't know where it came from. Now, the book of James addresses this question, why are you angry? And what I want us to do is take James chapter 4 and overlay it on Genesis chapter 4. Because James describes, what he describes here is really a description of Cain and Abel. James chapter 4 addresses the question, he says, what causes you to be angry? What is causing fights and quarrels among you? Don't those quarrels come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you do not have, so you scheme and kill to get it. That's Cain and Abel here. You are, are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war and you take it from them. And that's it, like if... If you can't have it, then they can't have it either. He says, you don't have because you don't ask God. So we're taking anger out on other people when really what we should do when we recognize it is we need to go to God with it. When we don't feel like our expectations are being met and when we feel disappointed and we feel bitter, we need to go with God to, with those feelings and emotions and give them to him because he can help us take care of them. Verse 3 says that even when you do ask, he says you don't have because you receive or receive because you ask with the wrong motives. There's a selfishness to it. And we spend what you do get on your own pleasure. So he starts off saying, what causes the fights and quarrels among you? What is it that makes you angry? And he says, it's the fact that you want something that you cannot get. Or at least not getting. Now, most of us will say, eh, okay, maybe, sometimes. But if you ask me why I'm angry, I'm not going to tell you a thing. I'm going to tell you a who. The question many people say isn't, it isn't what makes me angry, it's who makes me angry. And in my mind or in our minds of those who have the who problem here, if that person would just do the things that I ask them to do, if they would do things differently, then I wouldn't be angry. It's not my fault that I'm an angry person. It's their fault. It's not a what, but it's a who. And if they would start listening to me, and if she would stop being antagonizing, and if my child would stop being childish, and my teenager would stop being teenagey, and, and, and if my husband was more engaging, if my wife was more supportive, and if you know, and stop criticizing me, and he would stop dismissing me, and my friends wouldn't be so selfish, and my boss wasn't so demanding, and my coworker wasn't so irritating. I wouldn't be angry. It's not a what, it's a who for many people. And when they feel angry, they just justify it by pointing to a person. And the challenge here is for us to stop and say, why am I angry? And James says, look, you're angry because you have these desires that are battling within you. You want something that you don't have. And we see that in King. He wants what Abel has. He, he wants to, to keep doing things the way he's always been doing them, but he wants to, you know, to keep the first and to keep the fattest of him for himself. He wants to, to live life the way that he wants, and he doesn't want to, to change. He wants God's blessing the way that he's blessing Abel, but he doesn't want to change. And so the challenge for us is to stop thinking of it as a who and start taking responsibility for the what that we're not getting. We want respect. You're not getting it. What's it do? It makes you angry. You want it to be noticed and appreciated, but... Nobody seems to appreciate you or all that you do, and so you get mad. You want to be accepted. You want to have your way every now and then. You want this person to meet your expectation that you feel that they should meet, and you want what you deserve. You want your, you know, your rights to be looked out for. You want somebody to agree with you occasionally. 
you want. If somebody would pay attention, then maybe I would stop being angry. You know, if, if, if they would see things the way that I see things, if they would agree with me politically and my political positions, if they would just do what I think that they should, then we would not have a problem. I wouldn't be angry. And James is saying the issue is you're not getting what you want. And in James 1, he gives us a challenge. He challenges them to the same way that God challenges Cain. He tries to get them to stop. He says, you got to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So stop for a minute. Identify that you're angry and ask yourself, why am I angry? Consider, you know, what am I angry or not getting that I want? What is it that I want? What am I not getting? And if you can identify those things, then you're checking your blind spot. And it ends up be, being very freeing from things. James says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Be slow to become angry. Then he goes on in verse 20, he says, human anger does not produce the righteous life that God desires. <coughs> that if you're living life by this human anger, where you are slow to listen and quick to speak and quick to become angry, then, then you're not going to be, and you're not going to have the kind of life that God wants you to have. And, and that's what's happened in verse 8, where Cain says to his brother, hey, let's just go out to the field. And this is premeditated murder. While they're out in the field, he attacks his brother and he kills him. And many people will would look at that and think, well, you know what? I get angry, but, but I don't get that angry. I mean, I'm never going to do anything like that. You know, I, I just need to vent every now and then. I just need to vent. Sometimes I'm going to yell. Sometimes I'm going to throw things. Sometimes I'm going to say things. I'm wired that way. I can't help it. That's the way I am. And they dismiss. And, it, you know, and, and it's impact and effective or impact and effect on other people that are around them. Some people say, you know, uh, hey, I'm going to be, they, they become manipulative. They're manipulative. They act like they are the victim all the time. They're always, somebody else is always to blame. So they play the victim part. It's somebody else's fault, and they never take responsibility. Others get very sarcastic. It's easier to be sarcastic. That way, if somebody gets offended, all you have to say is, well, I was just joking. Why are you so sensitive? That, I mean, it doesn't have to be that way. Some people are passive-aggressive, where they, they withhold attention from somebody, and they ask you, what's wrong? And you're like, nothing. Nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. How about the silent treatment? Some just stop talking, and they think, I'm angry, so I'm withdrawing. But you know what? This is one of the most dangerous, dangerous and damaging things that you can do in a relationship. You don't have to be violent and have violent explosions when you're a silent assassin. You don't make a whole lot of noise when you're angry, but your body count's just as high. And so before Cain lost control, God asked Cain, why are you angry? And then God warns him with, about his unchecked blind spot. He says, but if you refuse to do what is, is right, watch out. And this is, this is coming up quick here, Cain. Look, it looks small in the mirror. It looks small in the mirror, but it's coming up quick. Sin is crouching at your door. It's, it's, if you don't get it under control, it's going to control you. You got to subdue it. You got to be its master. And you've got to stop and you've got to identify how you feel and why you feel that way. Because if you don't, it's going to come up very, very fast. And you're going to find that it controls you. And here's how anger tends to go I, I feel angry, I get angry and I'm an angry person. I feel angry, I get angry, I am angry. And this is how it translates by, by the emojis. 
I feel angry. I get angry. I am angry. So, so when you feel anger, God says, why are you angry? Stop and ask yourself, why am I angry? Because you see here, what, I, what I'm getting into, what's next? How can I, what can I take to find out what needs and, and how I can take my needs and, 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 and give them to him? And here's a vital question. Am I humble enough to address the cracks? Am I humble enough to check my own blind spots? God wants, he wants us to, he, he warns us, he loves us, and, and out of his love is how he warns us. The very same way he warned Cain. He, he puts his hand on the door and he tells Cain, hey Cain, you need to stop. Because what's your, you know, what's on the other side of this door is, is something that you can't get take back. What you're waiting for on the other side of this door is sin. And it's waiting for you. Why are you angry? God is putting his hand on the door of your life and my life, trying to get our attention because on the other side of the door, there are things that could be a real difficulty trying to back out of. In your anger, don't sin. And in his love, he tries to protect us. In his love, he warns us. So the question is, is are you humble enough to check your, your blind spots? Are you humble enough to say, you know what? I'm angry, and I need to stop and think about why I'm angry. I need to pay attention to what I'm about to do next. I need to pay attention because I'm at an intersection. And what I do next is going to have an impact. Blind spots, uh, blind spots are those things that are a whole lot easier to see from, from hindsight. I mean, after you run off the road and you think, how in the world did I miss that? Did we check? And so my prayer is, is that we would be humble enough to identify how we're feeling. To ask God for help and to recognize why we feel the way that we feel. And then be humble enough to surrender ourselves to him. That he will take what might feel as overwhelming as a weakness and allow his glory to be demonstrated through it when we're humble enough to see it, when we're humble enough to repent from it, and we're humble enough to surrender it to him. Let's pray. Almighty God, I just want to thank you for your grace because we all need it. Father, I, I want to thank you for Jesus and his demonstration of what this is to look like. He wasn't defensive and angry when he was offended, but he loved and has loved us unconditionally. And I pray that, that we could receive that and allow us to have that humility and the courage that we need even when things may be difficult things that we don't really want to acknowledge so God help us give us a humility to look over our shoulders and to check the blind spots before they, they sneak up on us and I pray that you'd help us to humbly surrender to you and it's in the name of Jesus I pray Amen this morning, as we sing our invitation, we're going to be using three, hymn 330, Are You Washed in the Blood, as our hymn. So maybe today that you're here today and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Master of your life, we want to give you that opportunity to do just that. So won't you stand? And if there is a decision that you need to make, you share that. You come forward and I'll meet you down front as we stand and sing.
appreciate your presence here today and hope that you've been blessed as we've had this chance to be in worship today. Don't forget the announcements that are be on the screen and plan through. Men, we do have a board meeting immediately here after worship. And then uh, don't forget Wednesday morning Bible study. It's great for us to be together and it's great for us to be able to come and worship. And we are blessed to have been in a country that at times we wonder about our freedoms and we wonder what's going on and who's in charge. But uh, it's still something we need to thank God for and be thankful for the freedom that we have to gather like right now. That, that freedom of assembly and to worship is very precious. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you so very much for allowing us the privilege and honor to be able to come together as your people and to worship, to sing songs of praise to your name. Father, to uh, gather around your table of love and memory to lift up people that are in need in prayer. And Father, we just are grateful that we could open your word and allow your word to speak to us. I pray, Father, that you will help us now as we have these blind spots that we could look out for and things that we need to be, may, we may encounter emotions that we may deal with. And I pray, Father, that you'll just help us be encouraged from your word thankful for your solutions, Lord. Lord, we love you, and I pray that you'll just help us to take the name of Jesus with us as we leave this place this day. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence, for it's in the name of Jesus we do ask this. Amen. Have a great day and a great week.